All right, so what's up, everyone? Uh, welcome to Educator for Impact's ninth event. Um, I want to thank everybody for coming out and supporting us. My name is Ryan, and I am the Chief Marketing Officer for Educators for Impact, and I'll also be the host for today. Um, so for today, we have a very um, wonderful speaker, Dr. Ping Chen Ye. Uh, a fellow silicon design engineer at Advanced Micro Device, which is uh, better known by its uh, name AMD. And he's joined us today to discuss insights into technology and the semiconductor business, as well as his opinions on AI's influence into our future. And when we have our Q&A, you guys can also ask and submit questions as well if you want to. So um, to quickly introduce us, um, what, what we are is a platform created to bring together different people from many different backgrounds and industries as well to share their thoughts and ideas about all things that are related to education. We truly and passionately believe in the power of education to not only influence students, but also parents and most importantly, future educators as well. Uh, you can find more info on what we do at educatorsforimpact.org. And besides myself, I also have eight other hardworking team members who are working with us to make this event possible. Next slide. So um, Dr. Ye, as I said, uh, is a fellow uh, Silicon Valley design engineer at AMD. And he's currently working on next-gen system on-chip technology enablement for artificial intelligence and telecommunications. Um, he has a wealth of experience, uh, first earning his PhD in electrical engineering from the University of Florida. And he's also worked at companies like HP slash Agilent and uh, Zillinx. Now, um, Dr. Ye himself will give us a brief intro into his journey and his current work at AMD as well um, as some quick insights into the AI and engineering fields today. So I'll let him do that. Okay, uh, thank you, Brian, for the introduction. Um, it's the, my honor to be able to get to be invited to this special forum. And to me, it's also a great opportunity that I can get to be connected with the younger generation to share my past experience in terms of education and also my career journey. And I hope that what I information I provide to you today can be can have, can have some give you a new uh, perspective in, in in terms of what kind of the college major you you want to be enroll, and also as well to your onward uh, career development. Um, so I do have like uh, uh, six slides, and I guess the uh, so Brian, can you help me to uh, flip it because. Um, Actually, I'm not calling from my phone, so I will not be able to see uh, the slide. Uh, so I have to, I need Brian's help. So am I, am I on the first page? Um, yeah, yeah, you're good. You're on the My Engineering Journey slide right now. Okay, um, so I think Brian already made a lot of the, uh, already introduced my background. So um, I'm the type, Taiwanese American immigrant. Uh, so uh, in the college, I was majoring in electrical engineering. And then after two years of military service, I flew to US and to pursue my graduate study initially at uh, Empress, which is uh, at Massachusetts. And then I went to University of Florida, Gainesville, um, in, uh, because they have a uh, much more uh, well, uh, well rounded in terms of the uh, research area, especially in the semiconductor. And um, so uh, during my um, graduate re research work, I have a chance to work in the intern at, the, at Intel. And then after the graduation, I flew to the West Coast and then I have been uh, launched my professional career in HP and slash Agile. And then uh, 11 micro device, Dialynx, and now I'm back to AMD because of the acquisition. Um, so, um, in, throughout my career, I, I main role I have been switching between uh, engineering as well as the manager role. Uh, I, kind of, I have been leading a team to develop a new device and technology for the product. And uh, currently, I actually at the junction of 
on the half of my life. So I actually try to decide what I want to do next, um, whether I want to stay in the industry or pursue my other interest. And we can go to the next one, please. Okay, um, so uh, my whole career is kind of evolving around with the semiconductor industry. Um, Nash is, if you have a chance to, well, or to have courage to open up what's only your, either your desktop computer or your other electronics um, accessory, you will see that inside there will be a, a, a several of the big uh, the motherboard, which is just showing, um, just pretty much like an image showing on um, upper right. And in on the motherboard, you will see there's a lot of the uh, black chips. So this is what we call the IC. Uh, in, in, uh, the full explanation will be the integrated circuits. Um, so the, IC, the integrated circuit was actually developed by the, by the Golden Moore, who is the founder of the Intel Corporation. And the, um, so he actually come up with a law that in the 1965, but then later he actually revised it in 1976. So the law was saying that he prediction that the number of transistor, which is actually uh, uh, the electrical switch that was placed inside the IC, the number of that was, is going to be double every two years. Um, so on this slide, uh, on this chart, I kind of borrowing the, uh, I borrowed this more law chart from the Intel website. Uh, the y-axis is actually showing the number of transistor on the in the package. Um, so if we today we are at about like 2023, and we look back on all the on the number of transistor that was the available in the Intel CPU, it actually quite follow the trend of the most of the golden most initially the prediction. Uh, the only difference is that originally he predicted that the number of transistor will be double on the chip, but then in this area, because of the uh, challenge of the making a small transistor in the circuit. So actually, the people become creative. So instead of building a two-dimensional chip, they actually start with building a three-dimensional chip. So uh, you can just imagine that suddenly you can increase the number of the house, the people population by building the tall sky wrapper. So by doing that, we can actually increase the, the amount of the transistor. So that's why we can continue to follow the Moore's law as today. Uh, and then, um, Brian, can you hit the, uh, can you hit the next? Okay. Um, so what is driving this increased number of transistors is because of this always some new application uh, that will take advantage of the increased processing power with this so much um, switch. Um, so, for example, these, um, I think you can see that at the, around 1970, is, at that time, it's mainly the electron radio that was the main application. And then if you look at the inside of the chip, uh, which is, you can see that there's a lot of discrete components. And this is actually represent one of the very early IBM digital computer board. I remember it's like the 1700. And then by the time in the uh, beginning of the 1980s, uh, this is where the uh, integrated circuit has been invented. And uh, now if you look at the, the similar chips that was processed with the three micron technology. So the three micron here is actually referring to the minimum, uh, the line width that they are, they are able to print on the chip. Um, so the, um, at that time, because of this increase of the, the process power, uh, it actually um, enabled the the new trend of the personal computer, as well as the video gaming. Um, it old days, I think people maybe still remember about like those, uh, like a pinball, for example, the Tetris and uh, like like a Pac-Man. So, um, so this is actually kind kind of create a new digital evolution era. And then moving forward by at the beginning of the 2000 years, and this is where the uh, World Wide Web or the Internet revolution is, is, has has started. To kick in. So this is where the Yahoo, the Amazon, the Google. Um, in this area, I think the demand was is not only the computing power, but also in terms of the uh, the data transfer. So uh, with, uh, again, with the miniatures, with with the increased density of the transistor, uh, it enable we to process the large amount of the data through the network, and then the data will later be be stored at in the cloud, which is moving into the 2010. 
And uh, this is also the area that when uh, when the mobile device becomes dominate. Um, in the 2007, this is a time when uh, Apple Steve Jobs used their first uh, iPhone. And what housing in the iPhone is actually the 45 millimeter technology CPU, which is showing in the uh, in the chart here. And then uh, fast forward to the today, we are at the 2020. And now, um, in addition to all the all the new applications that people had the vision from the past, that including the PC gaming, internet, and the mobile IoT, now we are in the area of the uh, artificial intelligence. Um, so this is will be propelled by the more by the increased uh, computing power. And in in this note here, most of the most of computers they are built up with a much finer pitch, which is typically is the five nanometer. And now in today we are also in the process of developing a two nanometer technology. Okay. Um, one thing is that the um, as a weak event technology actually becomes the uh, the, invest, the capital investment is become humongous. For example, today if we want to design a new CPU from scratch to uh, and uh, and uh, deliver to the customer, um, it will take about multi years of the collateral engineering efforts, uh, usually about three to four years, and with uh, multi millions of the R&D research investment. Um, next page, please. Um, so maybe you will ask about, well, so um, I know that we have a lot of transistors. So, um, can we look at some of the performance metrics, which is more tangible to us? So what I'm showing here is actually uh, the, uh, uh, the very early generation of the HP PC. It shows the HP 150. It was actually in the, in, introduced in the year of 1983. Actually, this is kind of coincide with my high, my high school years. I remember at that time I kind of went. I went to the computer expo and I saw this uh, brand new HP machine sitting there and it actually has some new feature that nobody has thought about it, which is the touch screen. Um, the way they form, they enable this touch screen is that they actually have the, L, uh, the LED emitter and receiver placed along the both X and Y direction. So when you touch your finger on the screen and it's going to block the light, just pretty much like the, uh, for example, the the automatic the garage opening uh, that is sitting in your house. So if you block the light, and then it will tell the it will tell the computer where is the X Y lo location, and then there will be a specific function associated with location. For example, either open the file or save the file to the, to do some very simple task. But at that time, this was very actually a very advanced the feature, and this is also. The reason that um, it's kind of inspired me that say, okay, uh, um, this is great. I want to work into, I want to work in this area, and uh, HP becomes my uh, my dream company. Uh, I want to work for after my graduation. But if you look at the other aspect of this HP 150, uh, the price is about almost like two thousand dollars, and it's running on the Intel A zero A eight at only about eight megahertz. And the number of transistors that they put into is the chip is about uh, 30,000, and the memory is about 256 kilobyte RAM. Um, and then, uh, can you uh, click the next? Okay. Uh, so, if I just use the, uh, for example, the last year introduced Apple iPod Pro uh, to compare about how much technology advancements we are. Uh, we have we have been harvesting through the past 40 years. So the Apple iPro, um, the price is about one third of the HP 150. And then the CPU that was housing um, inside this iPad is uh, Apple Design M2, which is running at the 400x of speed compared to the Intel 8088. And the number of tra uh, transistor is about 20 billion, which is almost like uh, 10 to the six, uh, six order of the original Intel, the processor. And we also be able to uh, store a lot of the data because the memory now is also increased by about 10 to the six. And then it, this is a touch screen, it's a very fine resolution. So um, eventually, uh, essentially we can touch any place 
on the screen and then do continue our work, either watch, watching the web or doing some Excel. Um, and there's some multiple apps that we can, we can play around. So what the technology is, it, is giving us is not, is the giving us a, a tremendous the performance uh, at the same power. And also one very important thing with the, by reducing the cost. So this is a major difference when you compare to the, uh, the, the industry production first research, first research activity, uh, because you always want to make sure that the number, the dollar amount you invest uh, will be uh, attract the consumer and because their demand is always rising. Um, so next page, please. So um, I think uh, maybe when you look at, remember that when I show you the morsel track, so I think uh, the trend um, or trajectory, today we are actually in the, in the AI and I think the, the AI has been popping out everywhere. Um, so here I just want to give a brief um, instruction to, to the AI is uh, essentially this is based on a, a neural network. So a neural network, Neural network is a type of the machine learning model uh, that is try to mimic what the, the human brain is operating. Okay. So if you look at diagram, here, it, it actually consume a network of the inter interconnect nodes, which we call the neurons. And then within the, each neuron, they have a connection, which is used to mimic the synaptics in the human brain. Um, and it was also has the, has a, a different layer uh, so, for example, the first layer usually kind of to receive the incoming message, and then we have a middle layer that was doing the uh, doing the, all the all the training and the math operation, and then we have a last layer that will uh, spin out the result. So, uh, for example, in this example here, this is a a, a very typical uh, training example is that we want to train the camera to be recognized a dog. Um, so the process will be like this. So, so the first dog will be digitized, and you will uh, you work all the digitized information will contain a certain feature and uh, age information of the dog. For example, whether the the nose, how many legs the dog has, and the tail, and then what's the color of the fur. And this information will passing from the layer one to the layer two. So each neuron here they all has its own weight and the bias. So depending on the incoming signal, uh, it will be multiplied with the weight and compute and uh, uh, produce the output. And then uh, you will decide whether this output, the, the strength of the sensitivity is high enough to enable the connection into with the next layer. Um, so the similar process will just continue until it the reach last layer, which is kind of try to conclude the older features that the neural network has learned. And then the output will say, okay, if this is the dog, and they will say, we'll give a thumb up. And if, if this is a cat, we will give it a thumb down. So this is a this kind of learning which we call the supervised learning. And it has been used very uh, broadly in today's education. For example, the image recognition is one thing. And also, for example, it can also be used in a, in a factory for them to, Try to swing to screen out the defect parts, um, and then now we are in the um, next area of the machine learning, which we call the generative AI. Uh, so the difference on the generative AI here is that in, instead of giving a certain prepared information, it actually you can accept the open end the question. So uh, the way it achieves is, is that it actually instead of just the uh, learning feeding information like like the dog, you will be fit. You will be trained with the uh, a lot of the older creatures, for example, uh, that is that can be uh, discovered in the world. So it can, you can think that as a, like a bunch of the supervised learning with input A and output B, but he has a way to actually to synthesize the output and then re recompose and to provide his own recommendation. Um, so here I just like to, I think probably maybe many of you have tried to have used the chat, the chat GPT. 
which is not doing itself the image recognition, but it, it has the capability to handle the large language model. So here I just try to try it out to give an example. Hey, uh, well, if I want to write a song that combine the Taylor Swift and the Leland High School. And it was the chat GPT, I think, first of all, you will look for is any relationship between the Taylor Swift and the Leland High School. And he was, that's the first thing the, the, um, uh, the model will, will be looking for. And then if not, then they will try to com combine the, well, what the Taylor Swift is, is the famous for, and uh, how can we copy and link to the student activity, which is in high school. So if you just look at the, some of the verse that they come up, and also the, you can also come up with some chords, which I think is uh, what's written better compared to the verse. Um, of course, I think the this is just showing that the potential of this uh, of this uh, AI and uh, um, of the output of quality can be further improved. For example, if at the prompt you can give it a much better or well crafted information, and this is actually now uh, a new engineering area that the uh, because a lot of people would like to use the AI as a, as a developer tool. So there actually an uh, engineering that is try to help the the person who tried to use the tool to to make a better face, in order to be uh, in order to have the uh, the the last language mark the AI to better know how to use the equation to come up with the better results. Okay. Um, and if you look at the just back to this uh, neural network, so you will see that there's a lot of the uh, parallelism as well as the uh, multiplication that is happening. So this is where the hardware is going to help to make the whole training progress to be more efficient. And at the same time, it also requires a software code optimization because that is also very important. Uh, but to make the, uh, in order to be able to shorten the computation time in a very efficient way. Next, please. Uh, the reason that we want to continue to improve the computation is because with the so many uh, energy that being devoted to to train the AI model, uh, their impact on the greenhouse gas emission is actually has start to concern the people. Uh, so on the right hand side is shown the, uh, the, uh, the annual carbon dioxide emission amount um, as the um, first of time. And you can see that in the past 100 years, actually the amount of the carbon carbon emission has actually increased almost 100x. And this is actually aligned pretty well with the uh, GDP, which is then for the gross domestic production, because there are a lot of the factory activity and people try to jump out as much of the car, uh, the refrigerators, uh, all the factory will consume the, the energy, which is um, in adversely will emit the CO2. And if you look at today, the largest large language model like GTP 3.5, it has about 175 billion parameters. And uh, this model is actually con con continue to increase each year. And then training a single AI model by estimate, you will probably emit about 600,000 pounds of the CO2 equivalent, and which is equivalent to a bias of the, a typical passenger car. Uh, if you're running his lifetime, I say about uh, 200k miles, uh, and it, it, in terms of the uh, carbon emission, and uh, one check GDP query will emit about one gram of the CO2. And the, currently, there's uh, we have seen about anything north of the 1.5 billion visit of a check GDP per month. So after you just do some of simple mass calculation, you can see that uh, we have to find a way in order to reduce the power. So that's why there's a need to have a continued improving in terms of computation and the data transfer efficiency, you know, to make AI more echo friendly. With that, I go to my, uh, we can go to my final page. Um, so, so uh, what is going to uh, happen in, in the next five years, I think in terms of a special hardware engineering, because this is the area that I had that I had been in. 
So what I, I can see is that the artificial intelligence will be become very pervasive. And it will be anywhere from either the cloud to the edge or the endpoints, and also transmission to all the daily life. Um, originally, I had a YouTube clip which I want to share with you, but that's just for the time. I probably I will skip that. But uh, but but essentially, it's just telling you that how the today the uh, uh, the AI chip that we produce, um, especially AMD, help to improve the people's life by incorporating all the AI capability into the handheld ultrasound that can help the people in the rural area to make some um, on-time medical diagnosis and without having to travel far away uh, to the hospital. So this is kind of the one thing that I feel very, uh, very fulfilled that knowing that uh, the work I'm doing is actually help to improve the human's life. And maybe some, someday I'll be one of the beneficiary of the product that I have, that I have to work on in the past. So uh, to make the AI become more computation efficiency, I can see that there will be three uh, main areas. I think need to have a lot of the innovation in the in the next past five years. So first of all, I, I envision that the, the silicon process that try that try to continue to uh, mil to minimize the digital switch in order to be able to have uh, as much about the computing power possible. I think that one will continue going as well as when you have a new computer architecture to help to process the data more efficiently. And then uh, the amount of generate heat, I think that definitely need to be dealt with. And this will be made very, very much related to the mechanical or the, uh, or the chemical area where a improved thermal and the cooling uh, solution will be needed. And last is that we, when, now when we communicate the data from A and to the B end, it always consumes the energy because the, um, the electrical, when they tra 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 travel in a while, they will be collected with the atom. So that will slow down the speed and also generate the heat. So uh, currently, I think there are a lot of development uh, look, looking at if we can use the light to transmit the data actually inside among the chip. And so, um, and the, this is also the one of the area that has been uh, grabbing a lot of the attention. And finally, I think um, we also heard about the, about the quantum computing, and I do believe this is in the horizon. But currently, it's probably still mainly in the research demonstration, and maybe about five to ten years until to be accessible by the general, the public. But this will be a good area, for example, for. For a, uh, for a young generation like you, if you are interested in this area and c continue to pursue um, throughout your graduate school study. So that's all I have. Okay, thank you, Dr. Ye, for that presentation. So we're gonna move on to the Q&A part of the event now. Um, if you guys have any questions, type them into the Q&A box or the chat box and we will try our best to get to them at the end. Um, so like we have our uh, questions in the Q&A, um, but I also have some personal questions as well. So mm -hmm. um, first one, uh, what first got you into the tech field and what has motivated you to keep going? Um, I think um, when I was a child, I, uh... Actually, I like to I like to open something. So I think, uh, for example, I like to open the for example the stereo receiver in my house. Um, I like to see what in, what's inside here because for me it's kind of the uh, I feel that the kind of exciting to see how this is going to work. And then um, after I entered the college, uh, I have chance to work for as intern at the as a computer as a fuel hardware QA assistant. So my job is mainly to, uh, when customer day, they're picking up working, and so they will bring, bring, um, bring to the customer, the, to the company, and uh, it actually give me a chance to open it up and then use the scope to probe the different electrical components to see how this works. So uh, by doing this, it actually give me a, give me a, a hand-on project experience. So 
actually I can um, I can try to verify what I learned from by look by looking at the actual circuit board compared to what I learned from the textbooks. Um, so uh, that's why I think that's why that's kind of uh, get me into this uh, computer and also the IT field. And uh, what motivated me to keep it going because I think um, as you can see from the most of all, um, there's always the a, a uh, a technology innovation is always necessary in order to satisfy the increased demand of the different digital application. Uh, the dynamics I kind of, for example, starting from digital revolution when PC and the workstation replace the, the mainframe computer and become accessible and then come from the internet revolution demanding. Uh, which require the connectivity through the wire or high-speed wireless communication on, on the mobile device and the, to the today's IoT. So this is all this, the, the especially which uh, personally I can also benefit by by using the product that was made, uh, which keep me excited uh, and to remain in my career uh, to further explore the any new application that can be, uh, that my, the work I'm do, doing can benefit. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, second question is, when did you realize that you had chosen the right field and like more importantly, like the right company? Um, yes, I think you, you, you will probably know that for, for example, when you start your first work, uh, uh, you, your field analyze, and motivate by your work, for example, every day when you come to your office. So that's why that's the time that you think, uh, you know that, well, uh, I think I in the right field. And, but then uh, you can, um, I also see that the, um, I kind of, I can continue keep learning the new things and then and taking on the new challenges that my boss was giving to me. And uh, in the company I work for, for example, at at HP, um, it's, uh, it's an organization that is well tuned with the, a lot of the resource that you can access. And uh, in that in environment, you are encouraged to learn. And then you will be um, valued and appreciated by the colleagues and, and the managers. So we should know that, uh, I know that all the work I'm doing has a good the reward, not only the um, economically, but also the in terms of the my um, my self accomplishment accomplishment. So mm -hmm. uh, yeah, and the and last but not least is the I feel like uh, uh, I can get a very good work life the balance. So and at the same time, I feel like I'm making a positive impact to the world. All right. Okay. Um, and then during this career. Uh, were there any challenges that like particularly stand out for you that you were like uh that were like really large obstacles to overcome uh i think the yes um i would say that the um what's when i at the graduate school i'm doing my research so the everything is kind of well controlled so once you are in the industry uh you are asked to solve the uh, every day you have a new problem you need to resolve. And uh, a lot of time you, you don't have like a week or a month to do your, uh, to do a very thorough study. And in this particular, in this kind of situation, you need to be able to make the right decision based on the very limited data that is available to you. Um, so I think this will be one, one of the key challenges that have been that I've been getting to. And also the, usually once you're in, 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 in your current position for a couple of years, you will start to, you will probably to get the tired of, of the work you are doing because and everything becomes very routinely and uh, you will be, and also you are beca you becoming so experienced that uh, you, you can handle the job or the task very easily. So, um, so there'll be, and then you are privy in the junction about the two 
decide whether it's time for you to move to the other area, you know, to broaden out your scope, or you just want to stay in your current job. Uh, but at that time, at the same time, spend, uh, spend time to the other uh, things that you will be interested in, which may not be the work. So, your, so the bottom line is that you, throughout your career, you will need to, there are a lot of decisions you need to make either on the technically or on your personal development. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, and then in terms of regrets, do you regret any decisions made in your career? And, and do you remember a specific situation where you might have wished you did something a little bit differently? Um, I think if I look at my career as well, uh, well I do... I do have uh, have have the been uh, have a chance to work on the different type of the project and task, which is starting from initially like for example doing the device modeling and then to the then later on I kind of move into the silicon processing and uh, now I'm mainly uh, responsible for the new product introduction. Uh, maybe the one thing I hope I can do that maybe is that um, especially during my younger career age, I would like to uh, to venture out more. Uh, for example, um, there's a one position that actually I had to stay, I stayed in that job for almost 10 years. Uh, of course, through, uh, during these 10 years, I have other, other personal um, tasks that I need to care with. But the, uh, if I look back, I think I probably should become more aggressive and then try out uh, some, uh, uh, some different uh, um, engineering areas, and even try to um, directly go into the management ladder instead of the engineering track. Uh, because in order to become the, a top management, so it requires a lot of training, which is in terms of the in different, uh, different area. Basically, you need to be able to have a very broad um, um, perspective on the um, into the project uh, in different um, trouble areas, and instead of like engineering, typically only focus in one or two areas specifically. But the, it all depends on what your uh, career aspiration is. For example, you want to become a, a very skilled technical person, or you want to become a manager role. So there's no right and wrong. It all depends on. Uh, what you what is your goal he, uh, here, and whether you have this all the action and then try to accomplish? Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, and in terms of uh, advice or other advice people have given you, what is the best career advice that you've received in your career that has helped you, like you know, push beyond your limits, maybe? Um, actually. <laughs> Actually, ironically, well, the one of the best idea now I realize is that the uh, to venture outside your comfort zone. Okay, uh, this means that well, uh, always trying new things that can help you to prepare for your next role. Um, and uh, so, this is actually uh, I saw this a lot of some of my colleagues they were actually doing that. And then um, I just at that time I just decided well I have I have other more important things to pursue, and the other net, other advice that I received that is the networking. Actually, I think this is actually one of the uh, the key uh, the key personal skill. I will probably also advise to uh, to younger generation to be able to polish to polish your interpersonal skill. Uh, because once you are in the com company, work on the project, it's a typically it's a teamwork. So you will be facing with the people coming from different backgrounds, and they all have their own agenda and the the goal they want to achieve. It. So a lot a lot of time in order to be able to push your 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 wish, you have to understand it what their thought is and what is their what is the tick point is is going to be. So uh, that's why I think this. It is very important that you uh, you you kind of continue to networking the people because it, this will help you to to brush up your your communication skill and also um, understand what the other people's the thought is 
So I think this is true. Basically, the the uh, have the courage to uh, to look at the different area and also the networking communication. I think that is probably the two best career advice I have received, and I think it should apply to all of you as well. Mm. All right. So um, final question for me is that like you talked a lot about your job, talked a lot about what you do in the industry. Um, and so we understand that your job is very demanding. What do you do um, in any downtime you have to unwind or just like relax or have fun? Oh, OK. Um, actually, um, I think I try to develop a hobby. Um, so actually, I'm currently I'm kind of um, into the into the, the photography. Um, so, uh, for example, every time when I after the work I come home, if the if the if the daylight is still on, I think that's typically what's happening during the summertime. I would just grab my camera and go out to shoot. Um, so I like to shoot the landscape and also the street photography. And uh, because this 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 is not uh, the way to relieve the stress, uh, but also connect my uh, inner aspiration in terms of doing the art. Um, so to me, the camera is just like uh, it's just like a paintbrush. I use the camera to capture the the beauty from the of the mother nature, and the it also helps me to um, to be more observant uh, surrounding environment. Uh, for example, when I on the street, I would just watch how the people behave, and also watch the background, and the, especially during the during the afternoon, I think the sunlight will shine on it, so it usually would create a very good like contrast and with different layer of the shade of the color. So to me, it's just like uh, using a camera to compose an artwork. Um, yeah, so this is kind of the, what I feel uh, is a very good way to release, to release the stress from my work. And other things just typical, like a, like a go out to go jogging, uh, uh, jogging and uh, biking. Yeah. Okay. And then we also have um, some questions in the chat. So uh, this one uh, asks, which jobs do you think could be replaced by AI in the future? So if you could give some insight to that, that could be good. Oh, actually, if you look at today's AI, right? Um, it's it's become a a soft a developer tool. So um, I think the people have uh, people have used use AI in a lot of different areas, for example, like try to do the some geometric frequency and also try to do the customer relationship. For example, today, if you go on Amazon shopping, there's always a chat box over there. And also there's people try to use AI to do the, uh, to do the self-driving car. I think some of the career that will be, can be replaced by AI is typically those, those jobs that, that, that kind of the involve a lot of repeated repetition. Um, for example, one thing like a, like a customer relationship. Right? So um, I think you're always being developed that the automatic answer machine when you try to dial the phone to to the bank and which is this is this is the first layer that you're going to that you are going to uh, you are you are going to have. And then other job, for example, like a, a, a programming. I think this probably maybe like a very uh, very entry level into some of the software coding that can be handled by the AI. And even some of like, uh, for example, the, the low firm assistant, um, as well as like the, for example, the, uh, some of the data analysis that will require you to, to, uh, to scan through a lot of the data, as well as for example, for the low firm assistant, in this case, you have to be able to read, read, read through all the low, uh, the load document and those things I think will be has a chance to be replaced by the AI. Mm, okay. But right. yeah, yeah. But but I think there was all, always because of this. I think actually free up the people to uh, a lot of the resources to be working on some more on some more advanced uh, um, challenges and the and the innovation. Uh, so I think. Overall, the AI is good for the human because it's, it's, it will improve our life. Oh, uh, okay. 
All right. Um, okay, so that's all of our questions. Um, and then if we move on to the next slide, uh, now quickly before we end, um, if you're interested in joining us, you can learn how to join our team by visiting our website under the join us page. Um, and the link for that is right there. And finally, I would like to thank all of you guys for coming out and supporting us. I would also like to give a special thanks to our wonderful speaker. Thank you so much, Dr. Ye, for your very insightful seminar. Uh, I feel like I learned a ton and I feel like everybody else did as well. Have a great rest of your day, everybody. And we hope to see you again at our next event. So thank you.